Order members, it is time now for questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and I call Mr David Hildage. Can to answer this question? East Antrim is part of the Northern Zone. A number of projects were prioritised within the Northern Zone Area Plan. Indeed, contractors are currently on site at one of these capital projects. The Causeway Rural and Urban Network Capital Project is for the development of a charity hub in Coleraine. In addition, a key revenue project, Employment Fuel Poverty, has just received a letter of offer. This project, worth £1.8 million, will help insulate and reduce heating costs in deprived areas in the ten current council areas across the zone, including East Antrim. Details of all projects prioritised within the funding allocation for each of the nine uh, investment fund zones are available on the OFMDFM website. I call David Hildage. The East Antrim area itself probably didn't benefit terribly well from the capital projects. Will there be a future? Uh, will there be opportunities in the future to avail of the social investment funding, uh, particularly given the financial difficulties we are in now, both now and in the future? Well, as I said there um, in, the, in the previous answer, there's a 23 projects to date with a total commitment of 34.4 million, right across all the social investment zones. And as of the 1st of October, um, just past there, there are further 12 projects valued at 18.8 million at final stage approval. And as expected, um, those of 12.3 million, which are capital projects within that, will be soon issued a letter of offer as well. So there's certainly a, a further um, strand of this funding coming soon. I call Oliver McMullen. Can I ask the uh, junior minister what opportunities exist to ensure that social investment fund adds value and complements other executive initiatives? Yes, um, we all acknowledge that working in silos doesn't work, and yet for too long that's really how business has been done. Um, the social investment fund cannot operate in isolation and must integrate and add value to other key policies and initiatives. For example, SIF projects will need to align with the executive's child poverty strategy to help in alleviating poverty among our communities. We are all too aware of the expected pro projected rise in child poverty levels and also in family poverty levels, more generally due to austerity cuts, um, which are, are unacceptable. We want this money to make an impact and address evidenced objective need where there is a clear deficit. There are also clear links to neighbourhood renewal, education, regeneration and employment programmes and investment and other initiatives in both rural and urban areas. SIF provides a real opportunity to bind these together and enhance the outcomes while addressing the gaps that exist. Moving on, I call Gregory Campbell. Uh, the individual needs review process was established to assess the needs of individual victims and survivors as defined under the Victims and Survivors uh, Order 2006. This process was informed by the key areas of need identified by the Commission for Victims and Survivors in its comprehensive needs assessment. The purpose of the review was not to extract admissions of any kind from the individuals who presented at the Victims and Survivors Service. Therefore, in delivering this process, the service operated a clear policy of confidentiality for any information provided during the review and ensure that every client completed a declaration to confirm their understanding of this process. Last year, the Commission for Victims and Survivors commissioned an independent assessment of the Victims and Survivors Service. As part of this, the service has been asked to produce proposals for a new assessment process, and discussions are currently ongoing. Any process must take account of the sensitivities and the need to ensure victims and survivors are not subject to unnecessary questioning, while still ensuring the relevant information is secured to make an informed decision in line with governance requirements. I call Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I appreciate the need for entirely innocent victims not to be subject to unnecessary questioning, but given that there are those who are not so innocent, such as the Deputy First Minister himself, uh, in the distant past, how does he feel about owning up to the atrocities that he would have been engaged in uh, as a truth recovery process to try and help uh, bring others 
uh, forward into 2014 with an understanding that people with blood in their hands are prepared to own up and accept the part they played in the past? The uh, definition of a victim is very clear and set down in legislation from 2006. I call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, the Minister will know the two, two schemes <coughs> uh, under the uh, Individual uh, Needs Review, which are most favoured by the bereaved, are respite breaks and education and training, which are both suspended due to lack of funds. What assurances could you give the House uh, that these funds will be secured under October monitoring, which I believe is three million, to get to the point where these schemes are back in, in play? Well, the member is uh, absolutely correct that these schemes are of huge importance to uh, victims and survivors. And uh, in our previous question time, I uh, made it clear that uh, we intended to deal with that during the course of our uh, agreement in relation to uh, October Monitor, and hopefully that will be dealt with shortly. I call Ian Milne. I would like to ask the Minister, in terms of independent assessment, what is the time frame for implementation of the recommendations? Well, in total, there are uh, something like 70 recommendations, uh, 55 from, individual, uh, from the individual reports and a further 15 from the Commissioner's cover and advice. Of these, ownership for 52 lies with the Victims and Survivor Service. Ownership for seven lies with the OFM DFM. The Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety has responsibility for two, and the remaining nine have joint ownership. Forty-seven of the 70 recommendations have been fully implemented and 17 partially implemented. All the recommendations are due to be implemented by March 2015. Progress against the implementation of the recommendations is monitored monthly via the Monthly Victims and Survivors Update Meeting. We will continue to ensure that whatever action taken in respect of these recommendations and, in particular, any others relate, relating to direct victim services not only happens, but, they, but that they are right actions and have the desired impact. I call Dolores Kelly. The Deputy First Minister, in relation to the support given to the support groups, if you like, the likes of WAVE, for example, of the victims groups, and there were issues around the number of pages in terms of application that individuals had to complete. Has there been any uh, flexibility given or consideration uh, to the concerns raised by those organisations? Well, I mean, that, that has been a subject of some uh, controversy for some time, and uh, there can be no doubt that uh, the Victims and Survivors Service have taken on board the uh, criticisms that, ha that have been made in terms of the difficulties presented, and we await the outcome of their deliberations in terms of how they intend to proceed with that. Moving on, I call Michaela Boyle. Question three. Uh, we are committed to achieving greater diversity in public appointments, consistent with the overall principle of selection and merit as a means of ensuring effective public bodies. We recognise that some sections of our society are underrepresented on the boards of public bodies, and we are working to encourage greater participation from these groups. Our officials have put in place several measures to raise awareness of public appointment opportunities amongst women and members of other underrepresented groups. This is an important step in encouraging them to apply. Secondly, officials have improved the processes for public appointments, aimed at making them more accessible and encouraging greater participation. Some of the steps taken include the establishment of an interdepartmental public appointments forum to share best practice across departments, including increasing diversity. Independent advice will be provided to the forum by a senior academic with considerable experience in equality and diversity issues. Producing the twice yearly all aboard publication, which gives details of public appointment opportunities arising over the next six months, and circulating upcoming appointment opportunities to an extensive mailing list of several hundred individuals and organisations, including private and voluntary sector women's groups interested in receiving information on uh, public appointments. Departments uh, interview larger numbers of applicants for appointments. Appointment plans will include guidance in respect of diversity, which has been developed by the Public Appointments Forum. Rather than making generic appointments, posts are filled to address specific skills in order to build effective teams and departments 
are developing alternatives to established criteria, such as better use of presentations. I call Michaela Boyle. Can I thank the Minister for his response and indeed the detailed response uh, within your own department and what they are doing in terms of female representation in public bodies. But can I ask, what are the statistics currently for female representation on public bodies for Margaret? Well, the, the, the recently published uh, Public Appointments Annual Report for 2012-13 shows that of a total of uh, 1,050 applicants for public appointments in 2012-13, 317, that's 30% uh, were women. Of the total number of people appointed, 291 in 2012-13, 40% of those were, were women, and this is a very welcome increase on the 29% in 2011-12. At the 31st of August 2014, 37% of the total number of appointments held were held by women. And while uh, some progress has been made towards greater diversity, it is clear that further work in raising awareness and encouraging more women to apply for public appointments is needed to ensure an improved uh, gender balance on public bodies. I call Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I further to, to Michaela's question in terms of does the, first, or the Deputy First Minister believe that there should be a change in legislation to ensure those groups, other than just women, uh, I attended an all-party group in visual impairment this morning, 1% of appointments across Northern Ireland are only with people who are visually impaired. There is discrimination against disabled people generally, and would the Deputy First Minister like to comment on that? Well, as, as a member, as well as all the other members know that uh, in terms of the answers, we have to have the agreement of both the First and Deputy First Minister in relation to it, but uh, I certainly appreciate the point that the member is making. I think it is a good point, and I think that it does challenge all of us in relation to the uh, level of representation that there are for diverse groups within society. So I, I will absolutely undertake to have a conversation with the First Minister to see if more can be done. Although I have already indicated in my answer that we are not just talking about increased representation for women, that we are looking at how other people within society can feel distant from decision making and how we can, as a, uh, a department, uh, ensure that we are putting in place processes which can see far, far greater representation right across the spectrum. Moving on, I call Colm Eastwood. Uh, the programme for government 2011-15 includes a commitment to develop the one plan for the regeneration of dairy, incorporating the key sites at Fort George and Ebrington. Job creation is one of the key priorities of the one plan, and this is reflected in the milestones and outputs identified for each year of the programme for government period. For 2013-14, the programme set a target of 1,000 670 jobs promoted through the public, community and private sectors. And we are pleased to report that the total number of jobs promoted for 2013-14, which have been identified to date, is 1,683. This figure is an estimate based on inputs from all departments, Derry City Council and ILEX's analysis of the impact of the City of Culture. The jobs to be created have been through small business start-ups and expansions support from InvestNI and as a result of the City of Culture Year. It includes two major inward investments by Fujitsu and Convergence, which together account for over 500 new jobs. So I, I would commend all businesses that have created jobs in the city during a very difficult economic period and at the same time recognise that, that much more work still needs to be done. I call Colin Eastwood. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer? Um, we all know, I suppose, there's a difference between jobs promoted and jobs actually created and people actually getting paid to work on those jobs. Could, do you have the details around how many actual, real, physical jobs that we ha have been created uh, in, the, in the financial year? Well, I think the, the important uh, thing for people to remember is that uh, job, jobs promoted effectively is a guarantee of jobs, given the commitments made by different companies, but over a period of time. Uh, not jobs that are put in place immediately, but they are not promises. They are very firm commitments, which are, uh, I think, having a very important impact on the uh, employment situation in a city that badly needs 
jobs created. Well, one of the key issues for the, the one plan is to create jobs in the city, and that's possibly also the biggest challenge uh, given the current economic climate. Uh, another departmental group sets interim one-year targets to align with the one plan catalyst programs, and each department reports back through OFM DFM to the strategy board. As I say, the jobs target for 2013 14 was 1,670, and this target was set in 2010 and was based on a number of uh, assumptions about future development. The major inward investments negotiated in 2013 14 uh, were Fujitsu, and as a member will know, the First Minister and myself met with Fujitsu in Japan, and uh, 192 jobs were then created. And of course, we met with Convergys when we were in the United States. and they are creating 333 jobs. Uh, as well as that, I know that there is a lot of work taking place under the auspices of InvestNA. And whilst InvestNA can't direct companies uh, where to locate or where to go to, I think there is a, a recognition at the North West, given uh, the difficulties that exist, not just in the dairy area, but in Limavari and Coleraine also, need to, be, uh, need, need to be tackled. And that's one of the reasons why the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development made a decision to relocate the department in the Northwest. So, obviously, you know, we're continually looking at opportunities to bring jobs to the city. Just uh, last week, the First Minister and myself uh, met with uh, a potential investor. Uh, it looks very promising, and if it comes Mr. to pass, as I expect it will, there will be further jobs announcements in the time ahead. I call Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. How many of the 1,600 jobs which currently deliver welfare benefits to other parts of the United Kingdom are located in uh, London Derry? And does the, the Deputy First Minister have any concern that 1,600 public sector jobs could be lost to Northern Ireland, or is he more concerned about Sinn Féin's pursuit of power in the Irish Republic rather than the jobs the of people in Northern Ireland? Well, I, I hear this uh, nonsense propagated uh, regularly uh, that uh, Sinn Féin's position on the welfare cuts, which are very ruthless welfare cuts and more promised as a result of the Conservative Party conference uh, last week, uh, is all to do about uh, the development of Sinn Féin in the South. Uh, that's like saying we don't care about our neighbours, that we don't care about increased levels of child poverty, that we don't care about low paid workers whose tax credits are being threatened. And of course, you know, we could all get into the politics of what about me. People talk about £40,000 a night to police Twiddell Avenue. That's £280,000 a week. And over a period of 12 months, that's a figure of some £12 million, which could quite easily employ 200 new nurses or 200 new teachers. I call it Maeve McLaughlin. Thank the First Minister, uh, Deputy First Minister, for his uh, response, and I welcome the additional focus and the focus on dairy in the Northwest. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister specifically what progress has been made in relation to the Everton and Fort George sites? Well, uh, a development framework for the Everton site was completed in March 2014, ultimately supporting an additional uh, 1,800 jobs in the city. Uh, and an additional gross value added of £42 million. The framework will shortly be submitted for outlying plan and permission. Current developments on the site include a two-storey underground car park and a neighbouring platform completed just now. Uh, many of the members uh, passing uh, on their way to Stormont will see that. Commercial opportunities improved for a further two buildings and a proposal being developed for a maritime museum and renovation work to develop a digital and creative industries hub. The Northwest Regional Science Park, which I had the privilege of officially opening just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the first development at Fort George uh, was completed recently. On opening, the facility will be 80% occupied, which exceeds its target. And the focus there will be on research, development and innovation. And I think that the the fact that the Northwest uh, uh, Science Park uh, of, a, of a regional uh, nature is now in position will be a major attractor on that site. And it was very encouraging to hear the people associated with the project saying that they actually envisage 
a very substantial extension to the science park in the time ahead. So I think that uh, that coupled with the expressions of interest that there are in Ebrington, uh, and there are many, and they are very exciting, clearly shows that the potential of both Fort George and Ebrington to deliver uh, many, many more jobs is uh, very real indeed. Could I remind members to make sure that their mobile phones are not causing interference with the sound system? And I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number five. I'll ask Karen Collier, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. We fully acknowledge that the needs of victims and survivors have to be given high priority, and we will continue to work to ensure that they do. We are committed to ensuring that the victims and survivors' budget is protected, and to this end, we have a bid for 1.3 million addition in October monitoring. We have raised this issue directly with the Minister of Finance, and we are confident that the budget will be protected at the same baseline as the last financial year of 11.3 million. However, we are also aware that there has been an increase in the numbers of victims and survivors coming forward to the service. In order to protect frontline services and in line with the level of efficiency savings is being sought from our department and its arm length bodies, the Victims and Survivors Service is seeking a 4.4% reduction in relation to administration and in funding to groups. The Victims and Survivors Service has been working with groups to help them find the efficiencies needed, and the service itself has been able to make efficiencies within its running cost to mitigate the impact on its frontline services. We remain optimistic that a bid for additional funding for the Victims and Survivors Service will be successful in October monitoring. Funding for victim services has increased over recent years, with £50 million being allocated for victims during this budget re-round. I call Karen McCarthy for supplementary. The Junior Minister for her response. But can she, on behalf of the Deputy First Minister, uh, explain why he and indeed the First Minister decided uh, to disproportionately reduce funding to the Victims and Survivors Service by somewhere between 15 and 20 per cent, while at the same time the Department itself uh, saw a reduction in its budget by uh, 1.4 per cent? Well, I just say to the, the member when I said my, in my previous answer, there has been a 4.4 um, efficiency savings right across all arms length bodies. Unfortunately, um, the bid that, that was put forward in the June monitoring wasn't met, and that's why um, we, are, we are very uh, optimistic that that will be met in October monitoring, and therefore the, those funding uh, cuts that you're talking about had to be implemented in, in that, in that um, last period. But I will say that, that we will um, you know, take forward. We are committed to ensuring that victims and survivors' um, uh, funding is protected in terms of the services that are being delivered to those victims and survivors who need them out there. I call Chris Hazard. I'm a bit last call and I thank the Minister for her answer thus far. Can I ask the Minister to outline when does she envisage a new Victims Commissioner will be appointed? Or um, the Commissioner for Victims and Survivors, Catherine Stone, as a member of the BOR, left her post on 12 June 2014. Our officials are currently working through the processes to appoint a new Commissioner. The appointment will be regulated by the Commissioner for Public Appointments and will follow the Code of Practice for Ministerial Appointments. The process will be taken forward by HRC Connect and advertisements have recently appeared in newspapers. The closing date for applications was the 12th of September 2014, and interviews will take place in the week commencing the 13th of October. The Victims and Survivors Forum, which was consulted on the skills and qualities needed for the role, and were taken into consideration when finalising the necessary skill sets for the incoming Commissioner. I know the member will be aware that, as this is a live recruitment process, it is not possible to comment any further. Can I remind members that supplementary questions should link to the original question, which was uh, about budgetary reductions? Can I call, I call Alden McGuinness? Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the junior minister for her answers. The junior minister uh, has underlined the need for reductions in, in costs and so forth. Uh, but to maintain and sustain a service, particularly in relation to respite for uh, victims and survivors, is that not so important that it should be, remain unaffected uh, by any sort of cuts? You're sending out the wrong message to victims and survivors if you do uh, uh, continue a policy of reduction in costs. Um, 
Well, uh, can I just say to the member, you know, I mean, we, we have to look at the real source of the financial difficulties that we're in today is actually a result of the Tory government um, reducing the block grant um, in, from 2011 in real terms by one and a half billion pounds. And I think that, that really, you know, um, that we are in the year four cuts, facing into year four of those cuts. And I think that, that, that really we're going to see that, you know, um, being the case uh, of all sort of um, funding. And I agree with you in terms of victims and survivors funding being very crucial. I have met a number of organisations and indeed individual victims along with Junior Minister Bell in recent um, days. And I think that, that really we have to, we have to you know, um, look, at, look at where those services are being cut in that. But I think that also we have to remember that we are you know, this is, the, this is a result of the Tory cuts to the, the block grant is, is, is the type of thing that we're seeing um, being played out and cascading down to actually, actually impact on vulnerable people and vulnerable groups in our society out there. Moving on, I call Mickey Brady. Chester, every year, question six. I'll ask her, call you with your permission. I will also ask you, Mr McCann, to answer this question. We are engaging with the main childcare stakeholders in a detailed co-design process to develop the content of the full final Bright Start childcare strategy. To date, this has included one-to-one -one consultation meetings with the childcare sector, all of which are now completed. Childcare strategy development workshops involving all of the main stakeholders will explore further the emerging key themes and issues. The first of these took place um, on October 3rd. Following the workshop stage, the Department will publish a consultation document setting out policy proposals for childcare. Consultation will include public consultation events and a request for written responses. We aim to launch our consultation before the end of the year based on the responses received during consultation, and we will liaise with the OFMDFM committee and develop the consultation document into a final strategy for publication following approval by the Executive. I call Mickey Brady for supplementary. I thank the Minister for answers. Can I ask the Minister to outline how the dual aims of child development and child care solely for reasons of uh, the labour market will be taken forward under the banner of a child care strategy? Yes, can I, can I say to the member that um, the early years interventions and good quality child care, including school age child, child care, are widely accepted as critical factors in a child's development. It is internationally recognised that quality child-centred activity in a safe place can promote positive interpersonal relations, develop cultural awareness and complement educational provision. An important aim of the Bright Start Child Care Strategy is therefore to support the development of children and young people and to enable children and young people from all backgrounds, including those most deprived, to avail of life opportunities. However, it is not just children who benefit from childcare. Childcare is also crit a critical enabler to help parents into work, move families out of poverty and to help break the cycle of intergenerational deprivation. Supported by an affordable, flexible and accessible childcare sector, parents can access work, improve their workplace skills and their employability or continue to be economically active. Therefore, along with its child development aims, the child care strategy will aim to ensure that no parent who wants or has a need to work or to undertake work related to training or study will be, pre be prevented from doing so by a lack of child care. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. As the executive rightly has put the economy at the heart of, us, of its activities, what plans are in place to help local businesses, especially small businesses, who will lose out in national insurance breaks when the childcare voucher scheme is done away with next autumn? Well, I mean, we've already had a number of discussions about the Child Care Voucher Scheme and we have met some of the organisations. Indeed, I think I'm, I'm meeting some of the, one of the organisations this week also that has raised that issue with us. Um, I will say to the member that we will be looking as part of the Bright Start strategy at all areas. I know that, that the, the initial stage here in the first 15 um, actions were, were basically around school aged children and the social economy model, but we are keen to look at all sorts of, of you know, aspects of childcare that will affect people. Can I just say that you know, um, in terms of the, the Westminster Childcare Payments Bill, and which the, the voucher scheme um, is part of, our, which, which there is a discussion ongoing. We had a meeting um, last week with members of the committee also in relation to that, and we, we are very open 
to uh, meet again and discuss on how we can um, liaise with the committee and other interested bodies um, to see, see what way we can take anything forward in our future strategy on that. And that is the end of listed questions and we now move on to topical questions. Question number eight has been withdrawn. I call Alden McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And noting the um, Secretary of State's uh, proposed talks uh, in relation to quite a number of issues, including this Assembly, uh, would the, uh, sec uh, would the first, uh, Deputy First Minister assure this House that there will be an active substantial and sustained role for the Irish government throughout those talks? Well, I, I think the, the member ha, has been around these negotiations as long as I have been and is, is well aware that during the course of the Good Friday uh, negotiations, the Irish government were involved. Uh, is also well aware that during the course of the St Andrews Agreement, the Irish government were involved. And of course, during the discussions on to the transfer of power on policing and justice at Hillsborough, not so long ago, the Irish government was involved. Uh, I think that uh, this is much ado about nothing. And I have to say, and I see the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party in the House, he was the one that raised this here. I think it was very disappointing and very unfortunate that people would try to politically point score over a matter of such great importance. Uh, these are discussions that will involve both governments. Uh, they are discussions which will uh, be watched very closely in Washington, both at the State Department and the White House. And there is a huge responsibility on all of us to play a positive and constructive role in an attempt to find a way through these vexed issues of the past, parades, flags, symbols and emblems and the budgetary challenges that we as an assembly and an executive face. So we're only going to do that if people approach these subjects in a, a responsible frame of mind. And I have to say, I think the comment made by the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party was totally irresponsible. I call Old McGuinness. Uh, could I thank the Deputy First Minister for his reply? Uh, Deputy First Minister has referred to uh, the United States government. Uh, does the uh, Deputy First Minister envisage any role by the United States government during the course of these talks? Well, I, I think principally these discussions will be discussions uh, which will involve both governments and all of the parties with uh, appropriate representation within this uh, assembly, certainly all of the major parties. Uh, and I think that the role of the United States <coughs> government will probably be along the lines of the role that they played during the course of the Good Friday, the St Andrews and the Hillsborough uh, agreements. They were all you know, very important agreements and I think the contribution made by the United States to our peace process and to the agreements that we've made has been absolutely invaluable. Uh, whether or not that uh, envisages them actually sitting at the table. Uh, that hasn't been the case in the course of the three previous uh, negotiations. Uh, I would have no objection to it, none whatsoever. But I think that's something that everybody would have to be comfortable with. But I think everybody recognises that whatever way this pans out, uh, there is going to be very proactive State Department uh, involvement in these discussions. I call Gregory Campbell. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can the Deputy First Minister indicate what discussions he's had in the past seven days to prepare for the uh, cuts in budgets that will inevitably follow um, once the agreement that he had reached with the First Minister was superseded by instructions from his leader in Dublin? Well, th th this is another fallacy that has been uh, promoted over the course of the last uh, number of months. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. I never at any stage of any uh, dialogue that took place between advisors in uh, my side of OFM and the DUP side of OFM, never at any stage did the First Minister and myself sign off on any agreement about how we would deal with these matters. In regard to the discussions that we've been involved in, well, we have been involved in important discussions in the course of recent times. 
Uh, we've met with the Irish government on Friday. I met with Theresa Villiers on Thursday. These matters were discussed. Uh, we also met with uh, Alex Salmond in Scotland, uh, criticised for doing so by the Alliance Party when we had very important discussions to agree a trilateral meeting between ourselves, Scotland and Wales, given what everybody agrees has been the very profound implications from the fallout from the uh, Scottish uh, independence uh, referendum. So nobody's under any illusions about the upcoming talks uh, in terms of what the agenda will be. Uh, and the First Minister and I, you know, we met with our finance officials along with our, our Minister of Finance, uh, where they, they recorded what, to our dissatisfaction, the fact that in the course of the last four years, since the Tory-led administration came into place, the block grant each year has been ruthlessly cut by this administration. And then on top of that, we have the welfare cuts. So we are facing very serious issues in regard to uh, budgetary matters. I call Gregory Campbell. So the uh, Deputy First Minister has indicated a whole series of discussions he's held. Has he given any indication then that given there will be cuts, whether welfare reform is introduced or isn't introduced, uh, whether through him or, th or from his counterpart in Dublin. Has he given any indication then as to what the extent of the cuts will be, either which way the, cakey, the cookie crumbles? Well, I, I think all of this remains a matter to be seen, given the fact that we are hopefully going to enter into very serious discussions, which will include very serious discussions around the budgetary situation. And the, the First Minister and I are, are, are absolutely agreed that in relation to the way in which the British government have dealt with our block grant, i.e. steadily reducing it over the course of the last four years, that is a subject for a big debate between the First Minister and myself and the British government. I call Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask that the Deputy First Minister, that I'm sure he's heard of some of the attacks recently in the Fountain Estate in Maiden City, even the racist attacks in South Belfast. But last Friday there was an attack um, in a place called in, uh, Convoy in County Donegal. And would the Deputy First Minister um, join with me in cond condemning all those attacks? Uh, without hesitation, uh, I was, uh, before I was even asked the question, uh, made it absolutely clear during the course of the meeting of the North South Ministerial Council that I was absolutely appalled at the uh, burning of the Orange Hall in a convoy. And in fact, it wasn't until later in the day that I actually learned that an attempt was made to burn the Presbyterian church. And the Buck Egypts that were responsible actually went into the church and attempted to burn uh, a Bible. So I think that uh, that on top of the recent attempt to burn our, the Orange Hall in uh, Newton Cunningham, as well as the uh, racist attacks that uh, the member has uh, mentioned, and of course the attack on uh, Podic Machines House in North Antrim. These are all very serious matters which conceivably could have resulted in the loss of life. And I think there is a responsibility on all of us to make it absolutely clear that there's nothing political about any of this, but there is everything criminal about those behind these attacks, whether it be the attacks on churches, the, the attacks on uh, GA premises, the attacks on individuals, the attacks on homes, or defenseless people who come from other parts of the world to live amongst us. It has to be unreservedly condemned by all of us, and we all need to be seen to be given real leadership in terms of confronting those who are responsible. Police have a big job to do, and I would appeal to everybody within society, including people in County Donegal, if people have any scrap of information whatsoever about the people who were involved the, the, the bigots who were involved in these attacks, they should, without hesitation, bring it to both the Garda and the PSNI. I call Sammy Douglas for supplementary. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his response so far. But could I ask him, um, are there ways when, with, with this assembly could actually reassure those communities, particularly those communities who feel very isolated? How can we reassure them, apart from giving information to the Garda Shikona or the, the PSNI? Well, I, I think when these attacks happen, we all need to be seen very clearly to be standing with those who are attacked. And, you know, I, I feel a particular sympathy for people who come from foreign shores and who come here and don't have any uh, friends in the community, or very few friends 
within the community, how isolated they must feel when they, whenever they get their car burned or their homes attacked. So I think there's a huge responsibility on all of us to be seen to be standing alongside those people. <laughs> Similarly, whenever the uh, attack happened at the Orange Hall in County Donegal, I was very pleased recently whenever the attack happened at Newton Cunningham that Patrick McLaughlin, uh, our TD for the constituency, uh, was there in full support of the, uh, of the Orange Order in that area. Uh, you know, I come from a part of of, of the North that actually has good relationships uh, amongst the community, the apprentice boys in Derry, the local community in Derry. There's great respect and tolerance for cultural traditions in that city. And whenever I see in the hinterland of that city uh, events take place which are an attempt to fracture the building of the good relationships, I'm horrified at it. I get very angry at it. And I think all of us need to be consistently challenging ourselves to see what more we can do. But certainly what we must do is be seen to be standing together against racism and against sectarianism. I call Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the First Minister agree that it looks bad for this executive and for this assembly when a minister goes to the High Court against another minister who has carried out his duties including consultation with other colleagues in relation to the publication of the BMAP plan? Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, the Minister for the Environment had made his decision in relation to the BMAP plan. Uh, that has now been publicly, over the course of the weekend, challenged by the Minister for Enterprise, Trade uh, and Investment. And uh, essentially, this is a case that's going to find itself before the courts in the context of a judicial review. Uh, I do find it very disappointing that uh, it has come to this, but I think that from our perspective, uh, without engaging in breaking the confidentiality of what's discussed at, at executive meetings, we were all very conscious that since the decision made by the previous Minister of the Environment has now been effectively uh, supported by the new Minister of the Environment, that we were heading to some sort of a challenge in relation to that decision, and uh, undoubtedly that will now be played out uh, in the courts. I call Joe Byrne. Yeah, would the Deputy First Minister accept, however, that after 14 years of discussions, DRD gave the green light to the Minister for the Environment to proceed, and that surely we are in a process where this organisation, the Assembly and the Executive, has to demonstrate collective Political responsibility. Well, I, I think I'll try and answer that question. <laughs> That's my job today. But uh, I, I do think, I mean, I, I want to reiterate what I said. I think that it is uh, disappointing that uh, it has come to this. Uh, a minister has made a decision. Uh, there is a question about the executive. Uh, responsibilities of individual ministers, but there also is uh, a, a, an issue of, uh, as you have correctly stated, the whole, the whole uh, approach of collective responsibility of the executive. And what we all have to recognise is that we're in a five-party coalition, where different parties who have a minister on the executive have different approaches to subjects. And it is very hard on occasions to get agreement on very challenging issues. Just a very short while ago, the First Minister and myself met with our Programme for Government team, uh, going through our Programme for Government commitments. And it's actually amazing the level that we have reached in terms of agreement and the implementation of our Programme for Government uh, commitments. But, of course, the media doesn't talk about that. The media talks about those issues which overshadow all of the good work that happens in the executive and in the assembly. So there are issues out there which are challenging, uh, which have uh, not been resolved, and we're undoubtedly going to face into trying to resolve some of them in the period ahead. And that is the end of questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister.